so exciting. 102 people have joined us. Almost 200 people registered. We're very, very excited. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Susie David Kenyon, and the president of the New York City Booth Alumni Chapter. Whether you lead a team of two or of 200 in person or virtually, hope you'll, hopefully you'll leave our discussion on leadership with some clear takeaways you can put into practice this afternoon. I have the pleasure of chatting with Rashira Chowdhury, leadership coach and author of the new book, Coaching, The Secret to Uncommon Leadership by Penguin Random House. Her book has been endorsed by leading names like Sheryl Sandberg, and it has been received with much global acclaim. She straddles the corporate and academic worlds. She is leading executive coach, adjunct faculty at several top tier business schools, and runs a boutique consulting firm focused on organizational strategy solutions. Her diverse and eclectic background in mergers and acquisitions, organizational effectiveness, and strategy execution coupled with two decades of experience in a variety of emerging markets, helps her grasp challenging people issues, which is something that we're going to talk about today. During her corporate career, she held leadership roles at Medtronic and AIG in Singapore, Qatar Telecom, and Tata Consulting Services. She's an alumni and executive coach for Chicago Boots ADP program, and frequently gets featured in and writes for leading business journals like HBR. She was recently voted as one of 21 inspiring women in 2021 by a leading women's platform, and we're not at all surprised. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Rashira. We also have the pleasure of welcoming Noah Askin, Assistant Professor of organiza Organizational, I will be able to say that word by the end of the hour, Organizational Behavior at INSEAD. Noah directs the Leading for Results Executive Program and the Product Management Executive Program, in addition to teaching the Organizational Design and Leadership Core course at INSEAD's MBA program. His research and teaching focuses primarily on firms, organizational strategic alignment, understanding and utilizing social networks, the what and the how of networking, driving organizational change, managing corporate culture, and fostering creativity in organizations. So all about organizations. Professor Askin's work has garnered him recognition on the Thinkers 50 radar list. His research has appeared in top tier management and sociology journals and has been covered in many international publications, including the BBC, The Economist, Rolling Stones, and music industry blogs. He has even given a TEDx talk on, the, on what makes popular songs popular, which I can't wait to listen to. Prior to becoming an academic, Noah had a number of roles in the business and non nonprofit sectors, and he received his MBA from Booth, as well as his joint PhD from both Booth and Chicago Sociology Department. Thanks for joining us, Noah. Thanks. I'm very excited. I, you have no idea how excited I am about this conversation, especially because I just joined a team at an organization where we are uh, launching a new vertical. And so we're onboarding people online. And so I'm fascinated. But before we even get into that, I think it's very clear to say that coaching has never been more important than it is now. Things are really uncertain. And, and leaders you know, need to figure out how to empower and elevate and enable their teams. And it's even more difficult when it's virtual or when it's hybrid uh, and people are on all types of devices and all different types of time zones, just like we are. I mean, all three of us are in different continents right now. Um, and so I'm very excited that we will talk about this. And before we do start, um, I want to remind, we already got a couple of questions. I want to remind people that you are welcome to ask your questions through the Q&A as you're listening in. Pop them in if, they're, if they are part of the conversation that we're having. I will certainly do my best to get them in at the right time. And if not, we will absolutely leave time at the end to answer any of your questions. Um, and before we get started, maybe Rashir, can you give us a synopsis about the book for those of us who haven't had the chance to read it? I mean, I, I've, I'm in the process of reading it, but for everybody else. Thank you. Firstly, thank you very much for um, so kindly inviting me for this. I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to be in conversation with you. And of course, Noah, Noah is, as many of you know, has been a huge, a fantastic sounding board. And uh, he's also been a very integral part of this book writing journey. So I, I think it gives me no better, greater pleasure than being here with my alma mater and so many people who logged in today. Uh, the book, Coaching the Secret Code to Uncommon Leadership, I'll pick it up here for you. Uh, looks like this uh, big spaghetti knot that sort of uh, untangles, but that's not all you do, right? When you coach somebody, you untangle the knot, but you take the person higher, 
to, you help the individual become a better person of himself or herself, right? So that's what it's all about. This is not a book that makes you a better leader. The assumption is you're already a good leader. This is about the journey from being a good leader to a fantastic one, a good leader to an uncommon or an extraordinary one. And that's what we'll talk about today. I've tried to talk about how coaching is that code or that key that unlocks this uncommon leadership, right? Coaching is a series of um, interactions or conversations which is really self-enabling and non-directive. And when you do that as a leader coach, you maximize not only the, the current performance, but also the future potential of the individual. Uncommon leadership is really about taking people along in this journey. Uncommon leaders are those that understand that they maximize their success by maximizing the success of others. When they elevate others, they go higher. When they shine the light on others, they shine brighter. I guess that in a sense is what the book is all about and happy to tell you more as we go along. Absolutely, can you tell me what led you to write this book? Okay, it's a long-winded story, so you have to be up for it. Um, so it's it's got two parts to it, right? The first part is how I got into coaching, right? Remember, I went to both, like many of you here. So I didn't see myself as a coach. I was um, this hard-nosed consultant who uh, specialized in strategy and, uh, you know, private equity, actually, at Booth. And um, uh, Professor Noah Askin was a young Noah Askin then. He was our teaching assistant. He taught me a lot that I know about strategy. That's how I met him. Right. So uh, I would consult on m and and transformation org design. That's my sweet spot. I still do a lot of that. And I was um, working for a large financial services organization um, in Singapore where I used to run the region for them. And there was a time in my life where I realized that I just wasn't growing. Um, it was a very toxic work culture. I wouldn't I would wake up every morning and said, do I really want to do this? And good old Chicago booth in Singapore called me to say that they were looking for a, they were looking for a for an executive coach for the newly minted ADP program the accelerated development program uh, on the Singapore campus the Asia campus and honestly I was very uh, conflicted because like a lot of people for me coaching was this fuzzy amorphous intangible sort of thing because you don't know where it starts where it ends of course over the years that I've been an advisor to organizations I've been told that you know, people enjoy having conversations with me. A lot of leaders say that I take away the noise and I give them clarity. So I had all of that. And of course I had some certifications along the way, but I didn't really think of myself as a coach. It wasn't by design, but it was a, it was a very turbulent time in my career. And I said, you know, what do I have to lose? So I took up this offer, said goodbye to my awesome organization. I carved out a nice severance deal with them and all of that, but I exited and um, decided to coach for Booth, the ADP program um, for the C-level. And I guess the rest, as they say, is history. Um, Singapore is a little village for a lot of you who are familiar with it. Um, and uh, I started doing this for a lot of other business schools as well. Started teaching it, started writing about it. And I got really passionate about the subject. The leader is coach, right? Uh, over the last several years, I've written about it and I've started teaching about it in many, many other business schools. And then a couple of years ago, um, I had this opportunity to write about it. Um, Penguin approached me to say that you've been writing a column which resonated with them and they felt that they, this was a gap in the market. And I said, why not? This is a really compelling message. It's, it's a good time, as you rightly said. Coaching has never been more important than it is today. Now, very, very turbulent time. So I thought, uh, let's take this time and let's write a book that hopefully can be some sort of a playbook for those that want to up the ante on their coaching and being better leaders and better leader coaches, I suppose. Yeah, we'll definitely unpack a lot of that because, I mean, we've had quite a few conversations now and, and there, every time we talk, there are new nuggets for me. But before we do, Noah, I know that, and Rishira alluded to it, that you played a significant part in the brainstorming maybe and just back and forth with the book. What do you think was the, is the key message to the book? If you had to sort of bubble it up, what would it be? So, you know, um, first of all, thank you for having me here, Rushi. It's nice to be able to do an event with you uh, after talking about this for some time and, and to do a booth event. I think this is my first booth event post PhD. So it's been a while now. I guess I was due. Um, but, you know, I think what's compelling to me, I come in at this as somebody who has a background in sociology and an organization theory. And what I like about it is, and the, the key takeaway for me is that 
look, this is part of a toolkit as a leader. It's something that leaders should be doing naturally anyway. Uh, and yet many people don't, or they don't have the skill set or the right frameworks, which Rashira does a nice job of outlining her particular approach to coaching her 4C model. But what I like about it is the, the use of a framework that thinks about it from a cultural perspective. Um, you know, I'm biased towards that as I think it's sort of the fundamental aspect of most organizations functions or functioning or dysfunctioning. Uh, and I think thinking about coaching as not something that you as an individual do, even though it is, but coming at it from the perspective of how do you start to put these practices into place in an organization such that it becomes what people do because that's the norm that's expected. That's how people who come in and, and are enculturated and socialized in that organization recognize that this is something they're going to both benefit from and be expected to do as they move along in, in their career with that, that organization. And they develop that skill set as part of being in that culture. That to me is, is what makes it compelling and, and differentiated from a lot of the other stuff that's out there about coaching. And it's so interesting because the last organization I was with had a mentorship program, right? And so like, if we think about, there are lots of words that people use interchangeably, but I'm sure you both have a perspective on what is the difference between a coach and a mentor and even a sponsor or an advocate? And, and how, how do you as a team leader play the different parts? And how do you, as the opposite side of the coin, right? How do you, as an employee, look for the right person to play these different roles for you. So I know that was a lot. And I think you probably both have different perspectives. I don't know who wants to start, but I'd love to hear, I think we would all love to hear your perspective. Let me take the easy bit first. I'll leave the hard stuff for the academic career. Let Fair me enough. give you Fair what I think, I, I think is uh, in my mind, the, the difference between uh, a coach and a mentor. And I have talked about it. I've referred to it a lot in the book. Incidentally, something popped up on chat. Somebody wants to know the title again. It's called Coaching the Secret Code to Uncommon Leadership. So if you missed that. Right. So I've, um, and as you rightly said, we use these two terms rather interchangeably, but there is a distinct difference. Having said that, both very important, but I think it's important to appreciate um, the value that they both bring to you. So in my mind, a mentor is somebody who's typically older, typically older, not ha doesn't have to be influential, been there, done it doesn't have to be part of your immediate work ecosystem. Could be a family friend, could be a past client, could be an ex-boss, could be anybody uh, who's dispensing wisdom. This individual has been there, done it, is giving you advice. So the key difference here is you tell somebody, this is how what made you successful and this is what you should do. So this is your, this was my playbook and follow this playbook. A coach on the other hand is very much part of your current ecosystem. The coach is guiding your current practice, not your career journey. Uh, and the coach is right there on the dance floor, giving you instant feedback, uh, rolling up the sleeves, getting into the weeds with you, right? So, and the key difference again is a mentor will tell, a coach will ask. A coach will ask you powerful questions to help you think for yourself. The coach will not give you the answers. The coach will help you find those answers. The answers come from you. So that I think is simplistically the difference, but you should really have both in your life. The third category, and, and we started talking a lot about it in the recent past. It's almost become a bit of a fad, but I do believe they existed, sponsors. We just didn't use the nomenclature. Sponsors are could be either a coach or a mentor, right? They could morph into a sponsor. But in my mind, while a coach helps a sponsor, um, you know, mentor gives, a sponsor invests in you. A sponsor is somebody who talks positively about you when you're not in the room. This is a very influential individual. This individual can open doors for you. And this is the individual who will go all out, go on a limb and advocate for you. That's the key. And I think increasingly I encourage people around me to ask, ask for that sponsorship. If you have a mentor who's giving you advice, don't stop short of just getting the advice. If you feel that that individual can open doors for you, you have enough credibility, they've experienced your work, they think you know, you truly bring something to the table, then don't hesitate to ask. Convert those mentors into sponsors. And perhaps even your coaches can be fantastic sponsors if they, have, if they yield the kind of influence uh, you need for someone to get you that next, not necessarily the next job, but the foot through the door, the interview, you know, the connection. So 
that's it they invest in you and they go all out, go all out to do it and now the tough part is for no to tell you how to find all of these people uh well i first of all you, this is a well timed question i'm i'm actually speaking to an insiad alumni group this afternoon about mentorship so this is uh it dovetails nicely but i, I think your definitions you know th- those are the working definitions that i use and and you pointed out the fact that we're starting to talk about these roles more Th- these behaviors have always existed within or not always is too strong but have existed in organizations for a long time but the fact that we're starting to put different names on it allows us to think about what's the skill sets that are required how can we develop people along those lines how can we make sure that people have their career development needs met and are then doing the same for others so i think by putting the titles of sponsor mentor coach it starts to allow these things to take on more meaning and a more central role as opposed to just the few good leaders and the few good managers who actually did them and had that that skill set before it can now start to spread across organizations and i think the other key thing that was important there is recognizing that these are not mutually exclusive it can get tricky certainly within your own organization to have certain people in certain roles in your career development you know if somebody's responsible for for your annual evaluation that can be tricky to have them in maybe a mentorship role or maybe in a coaching role just because the, you know our incentives aligned in the way that you want them to be um but that doesn't mean that they they can't be somebody can't be filling multiple roles something that i talk about to my students and i'm going to talk about this afternoon with the insiad crowd is thinking about developing a personal board of directors is what i call it and and um i think you know first of all i i can't take credit for the title it comes from actually the former chief product officer from netflix a guy named gib biddle who i've borrowed it from um with his permission uh but i think it's a really interesting idea because we often think okay i have a mentor i've sort of checked the box of my career development progression for now and it's like first of all that puts a lot of pressure on that one relationship but it also means you might be missing other aspects and angles um and so i think if you think about this as a suite of people that you're going to turn to depending on is it about a career transition is it about a promotion is it about a sticky problem is it about a relational issue you've got a, a kind of uh, a board that you can pick and choose the right people to talk to and and so thinking about having a coach or two on there having a mentor or two on there having a peer or two on there having a sponsor somebody who's i think of a sponsor as someone who has your back when you're not there right putting your name forward talking yeah. doing your pr for you you can't do your own pr work it's not really looked upon very kindly by most people so you have to have somebody else who's doing your pr work for you and so i think of a sponsor uh, along those lines and and so i think thinking about these three roles really allows you to start to fill out like who are the people that are going to help me advance in my career and i think one of the things we we talk about but maybe not as often is it's a okay case to see top people in and out of the back board of it right just like a company brings people on and off the board that there are people that we speak with that help us at certain phases of our careers that that maybe we we have to swap out and that that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think any any relationship most relationships go through life cycles. Uh all of them go through life cycles. Some of them end those life cycles end and I think there there can be concern whether you are the one thinking about who are the people on your board or whether you sit sit on somebody else's board of like oh god i've just committed to something for life here uh and you have it um on either side of things and and you want to evolve kind of as your needs change and that doesn't mean that you're every 3 year is just kind of completely refreshing but it also means that as you move on into a different industry different geography different stage of life whatever it might be it's not like you have to have a breakup conversation with with somebody you know the the less you reach out to them the the more it will become apparent that that relationship has kind of run its course and it will evolve and someone else will will move in to fit that fill that role so yeah i don't think you're n- nobody's signing up for a lifetime deal in those sorts of situations i think we all agree that having coaches is important but what about if we think about Rashira in your book you talk a lot of bit about how teaching is a coaching skill and that it's not sufficient you know like it has to be part of a culture um and it has to be embedded in the mindset can you talk to us a little bit more about that in terms of coaching in the organization DNA and what does that mindset look like because we all agree we need coaches but we also want to be hopefully down the line good coaches to others so so what does that look like yeah you know so the whole premise of the book is that um 
enabling leaders of tomorrow is squarely the responsible responsibility of the leaders of today. And the whole premise is that you cannot be a good leader without being a good coach, right? Coaching is no longer a specialty. It's not something you do in addition to running your balance sheet, the finances, the governance, uh, the processes in an organization, if I had to mirror the balance scorecard. If I had to look at your leadership capital, right? You have, to, you have the financial capital, you have what I call the relational capital, which is really how you relate to your customers and external vendors. You have um, the processes internally. And of course you have to build those reservoirs of human capital, right? And one of the key things that you do is build those reservoirs of human capital by enabling and building the next line of leaders. So the book throughout talks about why you, the leader should coach, right? So it morphs into why most of us don't and then provides you some tips and tricks and then talks about specific situations, right? So to your key question about how do you make this sort of um, coaching mindset into an organizational reality? You know, I'm of a firm belief that it's not enough to give people some coaching skills and say, hey, we had across the board training for all our managers and now they'll be fantastic coaches. It doesn't work like that, right? You and I have to buy into the rationale why is it that despite being aware, and all of us are bright individuals here, despite being aware that coaching is perhaps, or your manager is perhaps the single most important factor in your engagement, right? We, we, we leave bosses, we don't leave organizations, we all know that. Yet most of us either don't have the time for it, don't quite know how to start this coaching relationship, or fumble and stutter and stumble. And it's not as if it's malintent, it's, it's because I think often we tell people what to do when we should be asking them what to do. Because coaching is so much about asking powerful questions. And through school and college, we've typically been taught to have all the right answers. Good managers have the right answers. Uh, and you know the best bosses will tell you what to do. So there is this huge dichotomy here. We don't, we don't know how to coach. And when we do, we're constantly struggling with that. Right? So in order to really think about integrating coaching as part and parcel of your organization's culture or the DNA of your organization, you have to start at the individual level, which is A, why should you coach? What's in it for your coaching, but also what's in it for you? You have to truly buy into the rationale. Of course, some of us, it comes naturally to us. We have great EQ, as we say, and some of us struggle. But if we, are, if we truly believe we want to coach and change, it can happen, right? And then, of course, you can get those skills, but that's not all. To translate this into an organization capacity, we need to think about how we integrate it into all that we do and say in all our formal systems and informal systems, the way we hire individuals in organizations, the way we promote them, the way we measure them, and the way we celebrate them. What I mean by that is when you hire somebody, you hire for attitude, not just for skill sets, experience, you hire for potential, not just for pedigree, right? Do you, are these people keen on building the next line of leaders? Do they enjoy leading others? That's the key. When you measure people, when you promote people, when you think about the next role, are we promoting leaders or are we promoting superstar performers, right? Are we promoting those that have the potential to lead others? Those are the kind of things that we have to go back and think about. And we need to build that into the incentives. So think about it in terms of, I, I use a strategy uh, model, which I learned at Booth, the ARC. In fact, we used to call it Noah's Ark. That's how I learned it because Noah was, as I said, our teaching assistant. It's a bit of a joke. It's in the book as well. I was, I was sure he'd be miffed with me for putting it there, but he let it pass. But that's how I learned the model, uh, Noah's Ark. So the A stands for the architecture of the organization, all the formal processes, the performance management system, the incentives that drive it. R stands for the routines, right? The day-to-day -day interactions. How do you interact with people? Are we formal, informal? And C is, of course, the culture. How we celebrate individuals, how we, you know, how we role model um, those that build others and coach others. So long-winded answer to your question is it's not enough to say, hey, coaching skills, not, not, not enough for me to write a book. It needs to go beyond that. The coaching mindset needs to translate into an organizational, um, organizational uh, you have to weave it into the organization culture for it to really, you know, drive home. Oops, Susie, I think you're on mute still. Of course, a, a day wouldn't go by if I didn't put myself on mute. The mm -hmm. graphic that, and I didn't want you guys to hear the ambulance. Um, there's a question, I'm going to paraphrase it, um, that is related to culture, but sort of on the flip side. A lot of 
we seem to feel that a lot of uh, employees who make it into the C-level are a little bit more cutthroat and are a little bit more individualistic at times. And so how do we embed a culture of helping others when, you know, to be successful and climb up the ranks, you might, it might be sort of a dichotomy in some ways. Is there, when you think about that component, how, how do we uh, recognize, no, coaching is a good thing and you should be doing that? Well, cool. I can sort of jump in quickly and I think it's a chicken egg problem, right? So we talk about people being more cutthroat than C-suite is, is it, were they, did they end up in the C-suite because C-suite because they're more cutthroat or does the C-suite sort of reward that sort of behavior or create that sort of behavior? And so, you know, and this is why I, at the beginning said, that I think the cultural aspect to this and the emphasis on that is so important because if your most cutthroat people are being promoted up to that level, that's suggesting that, okay, we think coaching might be important, but are we really valuing it? Are we incentivizing around it? Are we evaluating and, and measuring people based on that? So I think that's a, an ongoing struggle uh, as, as when thinking about how exactly you're gonna bake this into organizations, especially ones where it does seem like more cutthroat people or more self-centered or, or self-focused people are ending up in, in more senior positions. And so that's really a, a fundamental aspect here is thinking about how does this get imbued across organizations? And, and you know, the framework that, that Rashira uses in the book is something that I've taken from somebody else and then developed it a little bit further to con consider what are, what are the structures of power and that exists in an organization because that becomes part of this too. Yeah. Who are the people with power? Who gets it? How do they wield it? Uh, and if those people are also reflecting the kind of coaching behaviors that, that Rashira is suggesting and, and highlighting in her book, you're going to see this again, become something that is, is not just at the C-suite level and not just for a nice to have at some, that some managers do. It becomes something that's much more widespread. And I should add here, um, some, coaching doesn't have to be soft and fuzzy and, you know, it's not about being nice to people, right? Coaching is about making somebody a better version of himself or herself. Coaching is about helping you uh, become the best that you ever, th you know, you, you thought you were not capable of. It's making you better than you thought you were capable of, which means there's a lot of tough love coaching. So we have to get over that mindset that, you know, where there's a, somebody who is nurturing and kind and uh, it's diametrically opposite to the traits we think of the C-suite leader who's driven and ambitious and wants to change the world. You can be both, by the way. You can demand more. At the end of the day, you want people to perform in achievement of your organization objectives. And you also want them to be better than they, they thought they were capable of. You can do both. As I think Noah gave me that line, you don't have. It doesn't have to be about the numbers alone. Grow your people; the numbers will follow, and that's the paradigm we have to change. We have to reimagine leadership to be about doing both. Focus on your people, and the numbers will follow. And I think the experts are now starting to agree. And and just to add in to this, because it, again, it all sounds nice in theory, and then you go into an organization, and it doesn't necessarily happen. And there's a, a fun fun is probably the wrong word. There's a study that I like to quote uh, that talks about how culture change happens at the national level. And basically, culture across nations tends to evolve most as generations die off. Uh, that's a happy thought for you. But, you know, really culture change takes place uh, as generations pass on and younger generations move in. And that's the, the really the biggest way that culture change takes place. Now, the organizational level that doesn't mean that the senior people are dying, let's hope, but as senior, more and more senior people move on, and these are people that, that grew up in organizational climate that was, that's very different from today. And so while there, might, there are going to exist lots of organizations that still have this kind of cutthroat, self-interested perspective, that's going to gradually shift as you know, business schools like Booth, like NCAD, like others train managers to have these skills of developing others. And they, they are teaching people to bring that culture and that perspective with them. And that's also more desired now than it used to be. And so you may look at organizations and, and sort of say, well, that's these coaching things. And, and these, you know, let's, if you grow your people, the numbers will follow. That sounds good in theory, but come on. And I think that unless we start 
sharing those messages and getting people in organizations, that cultural change is going to take even longer. And so this is not something that we just throw out there as like a nice to have. And it doesn't it sound great. It's this is how culture change takes place gradually and slowly and then all at once. Well, and I think it's very, it's interesting because people do sometimes think of coaching as a little bit soft and fuzzy, but if you're a really good coach, then you are providing sometimes difficult to hear uh, feedback to make that person better, right? And so there shouldn't be a difference. You know, you should be doing the best you can to help your people, good and bad, you know, just say it nicely. <laughs> And to be completely candid with you, and I'm supposed to be this leadership coach, and I started to write the book. I was I kind of got stuck on this chapter because I said, I have to talk about what coaching does for you, right? And I scouted through journals and HR journals and research journals. I couldn't really find, um, I guess I couldn't articulate how coaching changes somebody, right? And it said a lot of things about uh, return on investment, helps unleash your unique potential, uh, untapped reservoirs of innovation, and all that is fine, but what does that really mean? And so I started looking at uh, a whole bunch of rather unconventional media. I looked at, um, you know, I looked at films, I looked at sport, I looked at performing arts, and I used a lot of those examples to build that uh, 4C plus model that we were talking about. And it's a, in a sense, it's, I call it the four cornerstones. I won't go into too much detail, but when, what are the key coaching outcomes? What happens when you coach somebody? I think if you focus your coaching intervention as a leader into really these four buckets or these four criteria, I think it's a lot simpler. Every conversation, if you can somehow think about this is what you're doing for your coaching, first and foremost, clarity, right? As I was talking about the spaghetti knot and that you untangle that. But essentially, that's what you're doing. There's so much going on in our heads as leaders, right? It's not as if we don't have the answers. But when you have a sounding board, if you have somebody to have that conversation with, those uh, sort of big knots kind of form patterns and you're able to get a lot more clarity and direction. That's the first rule of coaching. It helps give you clarity. The second piece, of course, is that it gives you the confidence. And confidence is not just about feeling good about yourself, right? It spurs action. It gives you the belief in your own abilities. And a good coach, a good leader will do that for you, right? Will make you question what you can, cannot do, help you play to your unique strengths. The third piece is consciousness. And now that's really another word for self-awareness. The more self-aware we are as leaders, the better leaders we are. And the fourth bit is what we've been talking about, capability. And capability comes in many ways. It comes when you think out of the box. It comes when you, when you get the space and time to think and do your and 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 write your own playbook as opposed to what your boss has been telling you or what's been done in the past it's all that innovation and maybe even assembling your own career ladder right maybe it's not even a ladder all along or as Cheryl Sandberg says maybe it's a jungle gym where you go up and down and have squiggly lines our world has changed right so we don't necessarily need that straight line vertical path so in a sense that's what I think in my mind what coaching does and to make all of that come alive, as I was saying earlier, you need a culture that encourages coaching, where it's okay to seek feedback and receive feedback. The best leaders will also ask for feedback. It's not a one-way street. It can go sideways, upwards, and horizontally, right? So I guess that, in a sense, is what good coaching does. And, and remember, it's not just about the person you're coaching. It frees you up to focus on your strategic years. If you make somebody more capable, you have a lot more time and bandwidth to focus on the larger business challenges as opposed to getting into the weeds every time or micromanaging. And, and I, I just want to throw in kind of an additional point here. If it can, especially when talking about coaching or, or any of these more developmental roles, it can be easy to think like, okay, I don't have the time or, or this is just so other oriented. And, and the point here is not that, that a hundred percent of your time is spent doing this, right? That's not the case. And, and, if you share these messages, send these messages out there and people change their behaviors by 5%, it's a huge amount. That's a huge amount. And it makes a big difference all the way down the line. And so that's one. And two, you know, if you look at Adam Grant's work and, and he sort of made his name on give and take, this is the people that are most successful are not those that are just constantly giving. Those people become doormats, right? That everybody knows that they can just go to them and take from them. And the point is that the, the, his research showed extensively that the most successful people in organizations are those that give a little bit more to their networks than they take from them. 
it's not overwhelmingly so because that that becomes too time consuming and you completely lose yourself in that. And so this is, you know, setting up an ideal and suggesting that we move towards that as opposed to this becomes 100% of everything. Now I know you're, you're, not letting, you're not letting you ask us questions, Susie. <laughs> Maybe we should just keep quiet and let you do <laughs> your moderation. Great. I, I feel like the the more you talk, the more we learn, and the more dialogue it becomes. Just much more. It's like as if we were participating in some of your brainstorming together. So it's great. Um, yeah. But I do have another question around. I know Noah, you developed with a colleague, the org DNA framework. Is that sort of in line with what we're talking about now or is that a different component of coaching and leadership? So it's 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 connected, right? So this, Rishi uh, alluded to Noah's Ark, which I can't take uh, credit for having come up with other <laughs> than the catchy name to help students remember it. Um, but it's a model for thinking about structuring organizations, right? And so the architecture routines and culture, that's the arc. But as I was teaching my own course at INSEAD and or organizational design and, and leadership, I was thinking that this is, this is missing the, the power dynamic. Um, and so I sort of created, took some aspects of the arc framework and, and added some, some as elements of power dynamics and status dynamics and organizations reputation. Um, and so this is just, it's, a, it's another way to think about how, what are the different um, uh, things that are taking place, the different different flows of energy and flows of power and resources that take place in organizations and how can you think about structuring them and, and getting them all to, to fit well together. Um, and so, and coaching very much falls under that leadership, but it also ticks bo and leadership and power, but it also ticks the box of status, right? You know, if, if you're rewarding people with, with higher status to, because they're coaching, that's helpful. It's about routines um, certainly is part of that framework as well. And then of course, culture too. So it fits in very much with the way that I think about designing and, and managing organizations. And I think this fits really nicely. You teed up one of the, one of the uh, viewer questions, which is around how does this, how do we think about there? I mean, there's a difference between leading a team of two and leading a team of four or 12. And so like, what are the different muscles we need to flex as the size of the team changes, but also as the dotted line, you know, there are a lot of very matrixed organizations nowadays that have these dotted lines. So you report to two people or you report to one person, but you have a dotted line to someone else. How do we think about dealing with those types of team situations and dynamics? Sure, do you want to take this first or do you want me to? Uh, I'm going to be candid, whether it's reporting to two people or four people or uh, matrix organizations, the way the, I, when I started write, to write the book, my brief from, from Penguin was, it's a book for aspiring managers who have sh small teams or just starting to lead teams, or of course, experienced leaders could benefit from it. But the more I researched it, I realized coaching really should be a life skill. It isn't about the size of your teams and it isn't about um, having teams at all for that matter, right? As an individual contributor, as somebody who left the guardrails of the corporate world after this fiasco with the, my very toxic financial services firm, I realized you need coaching uh, even more so, right? So the situation you describe or the matrix organization, you have to also lead by impact and influence, if not hard lines. It's about bringing out the best in people. It's about enabling them. It's about asking them powerful questions. It's about not telling them, telling them how things are done, but really, you know, giving more power to the question than the answer. That's what coaching is all about. Coaching doesn't happen in conference rooms alone. If I alluded to that, then I didn't do it right. Coaching isn't about blocking time in the diary 45 minutes uh, for 45 minutes, three months in advance and saying, you and I will sit down for a coaching conversation. Coaching happens... Um, Yes, in conference rooms, but coaching happens in corridors. Coaching happens in those stolen moments in the car park, which will come back as the world sort of is opening up. Coaching happens on a virtual call when you, you know, just tell somebody a oh, fantastic job done. Coaching happens when you pick up the phone and call somebody and give feedback. So it's these formal and informal moments. It's, it's, it's these conversations, these self-enabling non-directive conversations that happen. And it, the size of the teams, yes, the more people you have reporting into you, I think you truly are responsible. 
for ensuring that you take them along in the journey, that you help them become a better version of themselves. But I think it, it is a skill that all of us should embrace, regardless of our role, whether we're entrepreneurs, whether we're setting out our own venture, or whether we're gig workers like I am. And I think it just makes us all better leaders. Noah, you can yeah, give I, us. I think, you know, the way that I think about leadership, and I get this from, from some of my mentors and people that I admire at INSEAD, is that, that there are, a, you know, literally tens of thousands of articles and books on leadership out there. And that's nice on one hand, it also reflects the fact that nobody has reached any kind of consensus on it at this point. And so one of my messages when I'm, I'm whether I'm teaching MBA students or, or executives is the theory of leadership that matters is your own, right? What is it that you think is respond, you know, is, is important in your leadership style? What are your values? Um, what do you care about? Now, that doesn't mean they can't evolve, they can't be developed, they can't change or be influenced. But, but as you go from thinking about five or 10 direct reports to 25, 30, 40, how do you scale? Well, you scale based on your values, right? Because if you try to, to pull in all these different things and put them into play, that just becomes too confusing. It's too many people to deal with. And so what are the values? How have you thought about your own theory of leadership and, and develop that? And, you know, coaching is very much one of those those toolkit that goes one of those skills that goes in the toolkit um but i think whether it's a matrix organization a functional organization a divisional what you know whatever kind obviously matrix is is more challenging because it's just more complex and confusing um but i think you know having a grounding in your own perspective on leadership your own skill set that you're developing and and those values is going to make that scale much better now, what makes it so tricky is that there is not a one size fits all for the 25, 30, 40, 100 people that, that are coming to you. And so you need to have a relationship with them because you need to understand what works best for them and what they're looking for. Um, and this is where the, the coaching toolkit, even if it's not something you're doing regularly, some of the skills that go along with that are going to lend themselves very, very well to developing and working in those relationships that you so that you don't have a one size fits all for 30 direct reports uh, and so that you're able to manage the people that want a little more direction with that more direction and those that want you to be more hands-off to have that be the case and and coaching is going to be one of those skill sets or or some subsets of the coaching skill set are going to really allow you to do that more effectively yeah in fact when you when you do the research and you ask uh, some of the what I, who i believe are better leader coaches than most um, and they give you a variety of responses. And I've tried to sort of say there is no right or wrong answer. There is, I try to give a template of sorts. Some, some leaders think you coach by teaching them. A lot of them will say you coach by role modeling. So and many of them will say, I take my direct reports along when my super boss is in town. Let's say he's here from the global headquarters. I shine the light on the individual. I ensure that the person you know, has to not just prepare for the meeting, but I also give this individual face time with my boss. That's how you coach. So coaching is not a one-way or a two-way conversation. Coaching comes in so many different ways. Uh, you, there are what we call connector managers, right? There's not, you can't do everything by yourself. When you recognize that an individual has some unique strengths and you want that person to play to those strengths, you connect them to the right individual so that they in turn can help them do better than they were doing today. So coaching is all of these things, right? And it, as, as Noah is saying, you have to find, you have to find your value. You need to find your own playbook and you need to find your own coaching toolkit, what works for you. But at the, at the heart of all of that is your desire to make that individual more capable, give that person more clarity, greater consciousness, and of course, confidence. That should really be the essence of coaching. It's so helpful. And I think one of the things that as you we were talking, I know we didn't talk about this together, but there are also people who want to be coached, who just want a manager who gives them assignments and tasks, and then that's it, you're done. And, and those are the people, probably you will have those people on your team, the bigger your team gets, that that's where you wouldn't put your energy, right? And, and that's okay too. Yeah, I mean, you'd want to be careful about that I, for that person's sake, right? I yeah. mean, the so we talked about coaching being a soft skill, and sure, first of all, most of the hard skills are going to be taken over by algorithms and robots sooner or later, anyway. So the soft skills are going to be what's left. Um, it's a little glib, but, but maybe not that much. Um, 
but you know, I think, I, I think those soft skills would, so I just started thinking about it from this perspective, right? What is the, the, the organizational expectation or like a lot of times when I'm talking to MBAs in particular, especially if they haven't had that much organizational experience, the expectation, let's take OB out of the situation. Let's take management and leadership and the people's soft skills out of the equation. The expectation is if I work really hard and do really good work, all the rest of everything will take care of itself. And, you know, we've got however a hundred people on this call or something. I guarantee you all 100 of them could come up with examples and life situations and personal situations where that wasn't the case. And why? Well, humans get involved and that's messy and tricky and challenging. And so these soft skills are the ones that matter most, especially as you continue to advance in your career. And so that person that wants the manager to kind of just give them an assignment and, and leave them alone okay, that, that can serve them well and that's their prerogative. And, and part of the role of being a coach is starting to let, let's get at why this is the case and let's understand and maybe help this person recognize that that will get you so far in most organizations. And I'm sure there are organizations out there where that, okay, great, this person's gonna be very successful. I don't think there are that many of them based on my experience. And so part of your role as a coach is to ask the questions to get to figure out why does this person want to be managed that way? Why do they want to be completely left alone, just given tasks, not socialized, not part of, of a team or something like that? And, and so I think it's very relevant for the topic here because I think that's part of the, the expectation of somebody who's coaching effectively. And, and it could be cultural as well. I mean, uh, if you go to a, a very traditional or conventional organization where somebody is just used to being told what to do and they're happy to implement maybe you as a leader need to, within the nuances and within, uh, while appreciating the cultural nuances of the organization, needs to do your bit to take those baby steps towards asking the right questions in a manner that is not intimidating, in a manner which is not, um, you know, it is palatable and you'll figure that out. You'll find your own rhythm. Yes. We can't keep saying it's all about you. I, I've, I've known of a lot of managers who say, you know, we want to change it. But we are stuck in the shackles of this really conventional organization where people just expect you to tell them what to do. They come to me for answers. And if I don't have the answer or if I ask them questions, uh, it doesn't go down very well. Right. So that that exists as well. But and I guess my answer to that, rightly or wrongly, is I'm not you can't change the culture overnight, but you can take those baby steps towards within the, the cultural norms, within the cultural boundaries appreciated and see how you can help these people up the ante. How can you make them better than they are today? And that's truly should be your role as a leader, as a manager. And I think that dovetails nicely into one of the other questions we got. And I just wanna remind everybody that we're, it's hard to believe it's already been 15 minutes. So there's not that much time left. So if you have questions, make sure you drop them in the Q and A. One of the other questions was sort of around the same idea around how do you manage as a leader and a coach during uncertainty or transformation to cultures coming together or maybe a company being sold? Or even now, if we just think about how many headlines have we seen about, we're going back to work. No, we're not going back to the office. We're going back to the office. We're not. So how do you, I mean, they're not exactly the same scenarios, but in the end, it's all around leading through uncertainty. Do you have any tips around that? I'm, I'm, I let no one talk, but I, I, I mean, I think my message in writing the book was pretty simple. Coaching has never been more important than it is today, given our very turbulent times, right? And right now you need leaders with a very steady hand at the helm. And do think about resilience and, and empathy as your, as your key rudders, right? As you sort of ride these choppy, as you navigate these choppy waters. You have to build resilience, not just in yourself, but also the teams that you lead. Organizations that have thrived, not just survived this pandemic or are surviving or thrive, are those that have been agile and nimble and they have quick, quickly pivoted business models, changed them overnight, et cetera. So I think resilience is key. But at the same time, empathy, talking about grief, uh, grief, burnout, these are the kind of conversations you need to have at work. So you need to be more empathetic. You need to listen more to people. It's a highly underrated skill for a leader. I, I would say listening, not to respond, but listening to assimilate and listening to help support somebody, that's key. And you, continue, you continuously have to build those reservoirs of trust. 
enough and more research will tell you that uh, our people today believe that leadership is not always as trustworthy. You have managers breathing down their neck. Uh, they, they have to be on 120% of the time. The boundaries between our work and personal life have totally you know, collapsed. So think about resilience, think about empathy, think about building those reservoirs of trust. And back to your question about what can you do? I say, give your people a voice if, you're, if you aren't already doing that. Take the pandemic as an example. Nobody can predict, nobody could predict. We're now, we're seeing some, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel, right? But yet things are so dynamic, they change every single day. And this is in the realm of a complex problem. It's not complicated. And what I mean by that is, it's not linear, right? Um, we don't have best practices from the past. No experts are telling us how it should be. We pretty much had to figure it out step by step. And at times like this, you have to give your people a voice. You need diversity of opinion. You need to take people along in the journey and you need to ensure that you surround yourself with people that because the best ideas can come from anybody, right? The best leaders have not said, this is how you do it. This is not a command and control culture. That has to change. You have to ask people and, and same for the hybrid or the blended work. You need to take people's opinion. You need to be, you need to stay curious and you just need to keep asking questions about what works, what doesn't work. And you need to constantly keep experimenting and iterating till you find that, that perfect model. We are a long way off from that, but we need to ensure that we take people along in that journey. I would add to that. I think that creates a little bit of a one-sided situation where it's putting the onus a lot. You know, yes, you have to ask questions and listen, but I'd also add to that your own vulnerability, uh, right? How do you develop trust? How do you build empathy? Empathy. How do you establish connection with anyone, not just a, a work environment, but but developing social relationships generally? A huge amount of it, it comes down to your own vulnerability and your willingness to share the struggles you're having, the challenges you're having, the uncertainty you're facing, and, and revealing your humanness and humanity to your team. Look, it's a tricky question, but it's a tricky situation too, right? If I reveal too much, I'm, they're going to use it against me or I'm going to, you know, and, and we tend, this isn't universal, we tend to underestimate the costs of not being vulnerable ourselves and we tend to overestimate the potential damages of being more open and being more vulnerable. Um, and again, you have to read the situation and understand who it is you're dealing with and, and what exactly are you revealing about yourself. Uh, but your own vulnerability, uh, in addition to asking the right questions and being empathetic towards whatever your team is going through, is going to start to build that trust. It's going to make people feel comfortable and safe sharing their current experiences, right? We, roll, we follow the behaviors of, of usually the people more senior in organizations because that's reflective of the culture. That's reflective of what's okay. You're being vulner more vulnerable with your team is going to signal this is okay. This is a place where we can do this and that's all right. And so, you know, as you're going through transformation efforts, as you're dealing with just more uncertainty in general, whether or not it's a specific transformation uh, uh, undertaking or just the current situation where, where things are, are very much up in the air, I think having some, some of your own vulnerability and willingness to, to bridge those gaps and establish those, a stronger social relationship is going to go a long way. I actually can't agree more. In fact, I have a client who's, uh, he's had a, he's, it's a diktat that after 6 p.m. nobody can have any, any Zoom calls because he said he's a single parent and he needs to attend to errands and he has a lot going on. And when your leader sends out a signal like that and he's vulnerable, he's telling you, listen, I don't have the answers and come 6 p.m. I have to be with my kids. I need to do what I have to do. It's an automatic signal for others to do the same. But as leaders, you need to send out those signals share as much as you have to or as little but you know you have to set the tone when um when i don't jane fraser citibank says no zoom calls on friday globally everybody says oh fantastic right because you're you're sending out a key message for your people and that's what you need to start you have to start role modeling and it has to come from the top and it has to cascade down so much great information. I feel like we can still talk about this for another half hour, but unfortunately, we're not even going to be able to get to all the questions that we had uh, coming in. There's just not enough time because I want us to wrap up with, if you can give me one or two tips or things that we can think about next time we're interacting with our team so that we are modeling this coaching culture for them. 
I've seen a couple of questions on the chat about how do you coach in a virtual world. So let me just assume we are doing this with dispersed teams or hybrid teams. And I would go back to saying, listen more, uh, especially in a virtual world where I know it's spotty Wi-Fi and, you know, it's dark backgrounds. And sometimes you can't even, you, you don't, you, you hear, but you don't really hear somebody. So I would say just think about, right? I think what Peter Drucker once said, look out of the window and see what's visible, but also see what's not visible. Try and make an attempt to really pick up the, the spoken and the unspoken words. It's hard. It's very hard through a Zoom call or a Teams call. But you, the leader, will need to find the time to, un to take people along in the journey to figure out uh, who's speaking up, who's not speaking up. If you feel somebody, somebody's struggling, you'll have to find the time to touch base with them later. Include everybody. And this is even more important now with a blended or a hybrid work reality where you'll see some people in person and there will be those that you won't see in person. And it's a hard one for us, right? So make sure that you, you find the right balance between those that are with you in person and those that are not. And you give them everybody adequate time. And the third thing I say is, especially in this, um, in this hybrid or um, remote world, think of bite-sized conversations as opposed to those long coaching conversations that I've talked about in the past. Think about grabbing those moments. Find, find those, you know, find that, that, that moment where you can have that conversation. Choose your medium. It doesn't always have to be a video call. It can be a WhatsApp message. It can be a text message. It can be a phone call. But find opportunities constantly to touch base and check in with your people. Find out how they're doing. Check in on them. Don't check on them is my message to you. Yep, I think I, I would echo those. I think two two additional things. One, make sure that you're sharing some of yourself, right? Yeah. As you do this, even as, whether you're as in a formal coaching role, informal coaching role, or just as a colleague. I think if you're not sharing some of yourself, you're sending the signal that like I don't really want to hear what it is that you're <laughs> that you have to say or how you're doing. Um, and so I think that th that that one is really important to to keep in mind in all your social interactions, right? Especially right now when lots of people are wrestling with lots of uncertainty and and stress. Um, and then the other one is an interesting piece of research that shows that people actually are better at reading others' emotional states with the Zoom cameras off when it's just voices. So phone calls and and the lack of video actually makes us better at paying attention to subtle cues and subtle vocal cues, especially on obviously not visual ones. Uh, and so be thoughtful about when someone tells you that they're okay, are you really paying attention to what they're saying? Are you really paying attention to, to some other actions and other sources of, of information that you may have about that person at that point in time? Because we can actually present in a way that doesn't always, that can mask uh, our emotional state, how we're currently doing. And so I'm not suggesting everybody just shut off their Zoom cameras and, and, and you know, fly blind, but I do think it's worth keeping in mind that especially in, in more touchy situations or where that nuance is important to pick up, that you're really, really paying attention to what's being said more than what you're seeing. I'm on mute. There's construction now all of a sudden in my next uh, thank you so much to you both. This was really so great. We've gotten so much great feedback too. Everybody, valuable. I think there were lots of questions. I don't know if I can offer your LinkedIn connections as a way. Please do. Please do. Sure. Have you. You can also email me and I will get the questions answered and send them back to you. That's no problem as well to our listeners. Thank you so so much. Uh, really amazing discussion. And then I wouldn't be a good uh, booth current president if I didn't plug the worldwide booth night that's coming up in September. So make sure, although virtual, make sure that you sign up for that if you're a booth alumni to join us for that. And again, I just want to repeat the name of the book for those of you who didn't get it but didn't also catch the name, Coaching the Secret Code to Uncommon Leadership. By Rushi. Check, check it out, everyone. I can vouch for it, having read it myself. Yes, perfect. Awesome. Thank you again. We really, really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for listening in. Thanks Thank all. You. Have, have a good you. day, afternoon, evening, etc. Night. Night. <laughs> night. Right. Night in India. <laughs> mm.